All right, let's get on with it. Uh, there's three brief topics I meant to cover here, the Caverity stuff, and I uh, used to do this every couple of years. used to do this every year just to update the numbers, so I won't bore too much on the uh, long stuff, but on the Caverity stuff, um, I build it on my side, static code analysis, upload it to the Caverity servers, and they analyze it on their side and give those numbers back. Um, used to be just C++, now it does C++ and Java. That are this year's numbers. Italo tried to steal my thunder earlier on. Um, it's been about a year and a half since we got the numbers back down again from, a, from their height. So we're back down to a, a zero uh, defect situation as of the 24th of September after quite a while. This is the historical data of the number of defects that we had. The next one makes it kind of better viewing. Um, low is good, zero is good. We made an attempt to upgrade to the most, uh, to the first 2022 20, version of Caverity at that point, rolled it back because there was too much noise there again. Uh, they deprecated that version, the version of Caverity we were using. So we were forced to go to the second uh, release in 2022, which was an even higher uh, peak of noise. So it's been a difficult process of bringing it back down to zero again. Um, there was new categories of warnings that Caverity found which are useful to us. It knows about standard move. It knows that after you use standard move and something what's left behind is effectively uninitialized or zeroed and needs to be checked. So it does that check now. It kind of knows about a standard unique pointer. Uh, it's not great about it, but it does find some issues and then often brings in uh, more noise again. And then normally what we do for the rest of the defects is that it helps me if we annotate in line that are false positives because in Red Hat we run a second Caverity instance that is not at all connected to the public one. So if they're in inline annotations, I don't have to do it again twice. Um, otherwise, using the web interface to say that it's not a bug or it's a false positive is helpful in that instance, but there's no impact on the other one. But that shouldn't really be a big problem for you. It's just why I do it that way. This is the Caverity uh, warning patterns. We have false positives, uh, intentional, and then there's a new one for don't even record it in the instance at all. Uh, that's rarely used in our base. So Caverity numbers, after a long process, they're back down to zero again, and that's great, and we're using the latest version of Caverity. Uh, the OSS fuzz, that's what Google provides. What happens there is that it's built remotely on Google's side. Uh, we have a whole bunch of fuzzers where we import in a whole different bunch of file formats and it finds crashes, records crashes, categorizes them into security relevant crashes and not crashes. Um, we have 48 targets in that directory there from GIF to doc to ODT. Uh, they're built with four different types of combination of fuzzers, address sanitizers, undefined behavior sanitizers, memory sanitizers, and then different engines that run that. Configuration doesn't really matter. It's very similar to the um, IOS case, just for reference. And then this is a chart of the reports we've had for the last couple of years. Um, first couple of years, huge number of reports, small after that, but then we add more fuzz as the time goes by. That finds things. And then, of course, uh, OSS fuzz itself gets smarter and begins combining things in different ways. Or, develops new features that it didn't have before, so the number has been growing recently as a number of reports per year, not the amount of backlog of, of unfixed items. Uh, this is just a sample bug. Uh, what is difficult with those, I suppose, is that um, documents that time out uh, don't get completed in the amount of time available. It'll report one of them for each fuzzer. If you were to fix it, then another one will be found inevitably so there's always this constant churn of, of timeouts. It's great when you find something that's an infinite loop because you've got a real bug. It's really painful when you have this constant sequence of slow documents. Uh, so you end up cutting out the slow paths in a lot of cases, whereas ideally it would always be fast. And Noel has helped out in um, improving the common cases that are slow, but edge cases often get just chopped out of memory. Similar problem as well. I have to deal with it in different ways. What's not covered by co fuzzing at the moment, which is the real problem, is that we're only fuzzing importing documents. We're not fuzzing exporting documents. And more crucially, 
maybe more crucially, we're not exporting that subcase, which is when you're printing to PDF. So you can still crash, Libre, you can still crash LibreOffice. There probably is a lot of crashes in LibreOffice that we haven't detected this way, that we could detect this way, which involves just importing random documents and exporting to PDF. That's uh, the second thread of that. The third thread then is the crash testing, which is where we have a uh, load of documents on our own servers again, on one particular machine uh, sponsored by Adfinus, and we export them to a whole bunch of formats, and we import them, and we see what crashes. And we do this pretty regularly, and we try and pick up on most recent crashes that people have introduced by refactoring things or, or whatnot. Um, we get the documents from Bugzilla, but one tool scrapes them from our Bugzilla and a whole bunch of other people's Bugzillas, and then we have a new tool that scrapes them from various forums, Microsoft Forum or Open Document Forums or, or whatnot. That's um, from Cisco recently. And then there's some other collections where we have documents come from as well, and I'd like to point out uh, a donation from Forcepoint of a set of documents that crash. Uh, that brings us up now to about um, a quarter of a million documents that we're processing. Uh, that takes about four days on this pretty good hardware to import them all and then export them in different formats. And then when they crash, to collect the back traces, et cetera, et cetera. The actual build time is, I don't know, minutes on a machine like this. Uh, Marcus has helped uh, set up all this infrastructure back in the day. So that's this year's chart of crash testing. At some point here, it's difficult to tell on the chart, uh, Cisco's documents were added, but uh, if people smarter than me might be able to find where that exactly happened. So that's the crash testing, and I'd like to say thanks at Finance for the hardware, and thanks to Cisco for adding this extra set of documents to uh, make my life easier over the last couple of months to try and fix, and thanks to all the people who have actually fixed all these people, the companies listed here are the people behind the fixes. Thank you.